Anak. Welcome to yet another session with ICBIS, your interest group for bibliographic standard in South Africa. Today's session is under the theme metadata telling powerful stories in uh, telling powerful stories. In the presentation, we are going to hear about how powerful stories can be told or realized through the creation of more representative metadata in the collections and to share information on how in information professionals can effect change in the standard we use to create this metadata. March is known as the Human Rights Month. And in this month, we also celebrate South African Library Week with the theme for this year, libraries telling powerful stories. A vital part of making these stories available in our libraries is in the way we describe and categorize them. That is by using cataloging standards like Library of Congress subject headings, CS list of subject headings, and the Dewey decimal classification systems. Colleagues, before I introduce our speaker for, for today, let's run through some few house rules. Please uh, mute your mic when you are not speaking. Questions and comments are welcome. And you're also welcome to enter the, your questions through the chat box throughout the session. And there will be a Q and A uh, session where you will be able to um, ask questions. The session will be recorded and posted on the Liasa News YouTube channel. There will be an attendee photograph at the end of the session. We appreciate and encourage participation, but understand if you prefer to uh, keep your camera off. Our speaker for today is Violet Fox. Violet Fox is a cataloging and metadata librarian at Northwestern University's Galta Health Sciences Library in Chicago. She is a previous editor of the Dewey Decimal Classification and the CS list of uh, subject headings, as well as the, the creator of, of the cataloging lab, a resource for catalogers to collaborate and experiment with creating controlled vocabularies. Violet has played a visible role in the critical cataloging movement, which advocates for the acknowledgement and support of marginalized and unheard groups in cataloging and classification practice. Today, Violet will speak to the changes undertaken in CS subject heading, a descriptive standard used in South African public libraries and how libraries can themselves endorse the changes in metadata. Colleagues, please help me welcome Violet Fox, the editor of CS Subject Headings 23rd edition. Violet, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, I am going to put in the chat a link that has the text of today's presentation. Um, I know sometimes um, if I'm uh, trying to pay attention or um, not uh, you know, uh, familiar with the language as well, um, I, um, I find it really helpful to follow along with the text. And so um, you'll find in that link the, the, the full text of the chat of, of the presentation as well as um, a few links um, to other to documents as well. So um, hopefully that's helpful. First off, before before I get started, I want to thank you, um, say thank you to, so much to Apalele for providing technical support, uh, to Fatima, Sarah, Ingrid, uh, Mercia, and the members of IGBIS for bringing me here today, and to everyone who has helped make South Africa Library Week a success. I know it's a lot of work to bring everyone together, uh, but it's so valuable. I'm really thrilled to talk with you today, and especially I'm excited to talk about Sears, which I haven't had the opportunity to talk about before. All right, let's get started. So today's talk. Uh, let me tell you what I'm going to cover in this presentation. First, I'll tell you about my background so you can have a better sense of who I am and what's important to me. I'll talk about critical cataloging, what that means and how it informs the work that I do. 
I'll briefly talk about my work as an editor of the Dewey Decimal Classification and how that also informs the work that I do as the editor of Sears. Without getting into too much detail, I'll talk about the background of the Sears list of subject headings and what has changed recently, which makes now a great time to make changes happen. Along the way, I'll touch on some of the unique things about Sears and how it's used and how you can make it work better for your own users. Finally, I'll talk about how you can suggest changes to Sears to include more South African specific terms. I'm going to leave plenty of room for questions because I really, really want to hear from you about what might make Sears better for your users. I know it's really intimidating to ask questions, especially in front of people in your presentation, uh, but I hope that um, you'll, you'll have questions for me because I really want to hear from you. All right, so about me. I started a new job working at Northwestern University's Medical School in Chicago last year. My title is Cataloging and Metadata Librarian. So I catalog books and work on other projects, like improving the metadata in our institutional repository. I graduated from the University of Washington I School with my library degree in 2013, but I worked as a paraprofessional copy cataloger for several years before I went to library school. So I've been in the profession for a while. And one last thing about me is that I've been a part of the zine librarian community since 2009. Zines are self-published works that can be about any topic at all, but often come from a, from a countercultural perspective. One of my more recent zines was called The Disorientation Guide to Librarianship. You can see the cover on the, sc on the screen. Um, and that zine is essentially an introduction for people who are new to libraries about some of the less positive aspects of librarianship, including some of the ways that library libraries can reinforce in oppressive structures like racism. In the introduction, I try to explain that the disorientation guide to librarianship isn't negative for the sake of being negative. Instead, as individuals and as a profession, we need to understand the problems in the structures that we work within in order to make substantive change. So that brings me to critical librarianship which we sometimes talk about as crit lib. Uh, critical librarianship is dedicated to the idea of bringing the principles of social justice into our work in libraries. This idea of crit lib follows in a long tradition of radical librarianship, which is an idea it's always in flux, but generally it looks to find ways to ensure we're fighting the good fight in libraries. And you can see uh, critlib.org, that's the website that I have um, a screen from, a screenshot from on the, uh, on the screen. Along the same lines, uh, critical cataloging, we often abbreviate that just to CritCat. It looks at the ethics of library metadata, cataloging and classification standards, practice and infrastructure. Especially in the past few years, you might've heard this called a wide variety of things. Uh, this critical cataloging, uh, radical cataloging, reparative metadata, conscious editing, metadata justice, and so on. Lots of different terms for this. Uh, I think the work being done under those labels is very similar, uh, even though they have these different names. We're all looking at the ways that we, we, uh, we in libraries and archives that describe the material in our collections and seeing some problems with the way that we've done that in the past and looking to do better in the future by using more respectful terminology, but also by making sure that this work isn't just done by white, middle-class, straight, able-bodied people with a very narrow idea about the world. So I often do whole presentations about uh, critical cataloging. I have a lot to say about this topic. Um, I'll stop there for now, but of course I welcome your questions about what critical cataloging is or what it means in practice. I was a cataloger at academic libraries for the first few years of my professional career, 
Uh, but in 2018, I was hired as one of the editors of the Dewey Decimal Classification. So some people don't know that Dewey is constantly updated. Um, and many people don't know that there are editors who are paid to do that work. And by that work, I mean uh, adding and revising Dewey numbers, essentially. Dewey is owned by OCLC. So I was working for OCLC as, a, as the, mm -hmm. one of the editors of Dewey. While I was there, I made a lot of updates, including revisions to change the wording around disabilities and to add new Dewey numbers and revise old ones to more appropriately describe books about witchcraft, books about sexuality, and books about transgender people. So more importantly, I think, um, I opened the process of editorial revisions. Before I started, proposals to change Dewey numbers were closed off. No one outside of a dozen people could see them. But now those proposals to change Dewey are open to the public and anyone can re review those proposals to revise the numbers before the changes are implemented. I also set up a website to encourage library workers like you uh, to pro propose their own revisions. Uh, unfortunately, after I set this up, OCLC laid me off in 2020. Uh, they started a program for having this complex work done by temporary student interns. While a few years ago, there was a staff of five editors doing this work, there's now just one full-time editor being paid to do this work. Uh, but while I was editing, I developed an orientation towards not just doing the classification work itself, but also talking about it, uh, making it clear the structure of that system and the assumptions that it's based on and who makes the decisions in changing that system. Those are things that are very important to me in my cataloging work uh, and have, have continued with my work in Sears. So about a year after I was laid off, I was approached by the owners of Gray House Publishing to edit the 23rd edition of Sears. On the screen is the 22nd edition of Sears, which is confusing. Uh, 2023 is actually the 100th anniversary of the Sears list of subject headings. It was created by an American library named Minnie Earl Sears. That's her on the screen. So our friend Minnie here was a cataloger who realized that the Library of Congress subject headings is great for academic libraries, uh, but it's too large and too detailed to be, um, to be uh, appropriately used by smaller libraries, like school and public libraries. And she realized this in the 1920s when the, the number of LCSH um, was much, much smaller than it is now. Essentially, she based her list of subject headings on LCSH, uh, but simplified it in a few ways, including using fewer terms. Uh, so while uh, LCSH is many volumes, if you printed it out, it would be many, many volumes, uh, about 40 or 50, I believe, at last, last I remember. Um, and here's sub list of subject heading is just the one book, one volume. Uh, so including, so she, the simplification also included using less technical terminology in Sears uh, and using direct language, for example, using French literature instead of literature comma French. So those things are make it more simple to use uh, for the users and also for the catalogers, I think. Like I said, Sears has been published since 1923. For a while now, it's been on a four year editorial cycle which means a new print edition is published every four years. But the interesting thing here is that Sears has been in flux the last few editions and things have changed quite a bit in the editorial work. So for many decades, Sears had been published by the publisher H.W. Wilson. In 2011, the giant publisher EBSCO uh, bought H.W. Wilson and it became, uh, and H.W. Wilson became one of the divisions of EBSCO. So the 21st edition in 2014 was published by EBSCO. In 2018, uh, Greyhouse bought the rights to publish Sears from EBSCO. So the 22nd and 23rd editions, the last two editions, have been published by Greyhouse. So you can ask why I'm not telling you all of this, the publishing stuff, it doesn't really matter. 
but uh, you should know that that has meant significant changes in the way that Sears is edited. In the past, H.W. Wilson had a full-time staff person uh, as, as the editor. They had multiple associate editors. Part of that their, their job uh, was maintaining Sears. So that meant when a question came in about the classification, there was someone answering emails and taking suggestions and gradually making changes. The editor would be compiling those changes over that four year period as a part of their regular work. But because of those changes in publishing companies that I was just talking about, that's no longer how this works. Greyhouse no longer pays a full-time Sears editor to do this work. Instead, they've just decided to hire someone on a part-time contract basis to make changes every once in a while. So that's how I was hired on, um, on a contract basis to edit the 23rd edition. So I, again, I know that this might feel like details you might need, not need to know, but it really does impact the, the, set, um, the subject headings quite a bit and the way that, that everything is um, revised. So if you email Sears with an editorial question right now, you might not get an answer. Uh, because right now there's no one there being paid to do the editorial work. So I um, was the editor of the, the 23rd edition um, just for a short period of time while that book was being revised. Um, I'm only getting paid for the months when they've contracted me to do this work. So I'm sharing this because I think it's important to be transparent about who's doing this work and how it gets done. As you know, the resources that you have or don't have in libraries, especially, make a huge difference in the quality of the work that you can do. Uh, so, so there's, um, you can see there's kind of a, um, a parallel. There, there were many editors of Dewey, and now there's just the one editor of Dewey. And there were multiple editors of Sears, and now there's just one part-time person working on the editorial work of Sears. Um, these labor issues are hard to see, but they really do impact this work. So at the same time, all of those changes means that now is a great time to shake things up with Sears, to do things in different ways, to deviate from LCSH more than has been done in the past, to reconsider the principles that Sears is based on, and maybe to do some critical cataloging work with it. So here's the 23rd edition, uh, the one that I edited. And I just wanted to share a few examples. Uh, that I know this is hard to see on the screen, um, but I was able to make these changes in the 23rd edition with the goal of moving from euphemistic or outdated terms to more common terms, at least here in the US. Uh, so the full list of revised headings is available online, even if you don't have a subscription to the online version. One of the things that I think is so interesting about Sears is that it's very flexible. If there's a term that's not in the Sears list, you are explicitly told in the instructions of Sears that you can add it. Uh, in some ways, that makes Sears harder to use than LCSH. Think of it this way. In LCSH, there's a list of all the subject headings that you can use. That's it, that's a list, those are the headings. And if something isn't on the list of LCSH, it's not valid. But with Sears, catalogers have to make those decisions themselves. For example, leopards isn't currently a, sub a subject heading in the Sears list. But if you in your library have some books about leopards and you think it would be useful to your users to add a local heading for le leopards, then you're not only allowed to do that by Sears, but encouraged to do it. So you can find more information about that, um, those instructions in the maintaining a catalog section of the principles of Sears list of subject headings. We call that the front matter. If you have a physical book, it's in the very uh, first couple of pages, um, the principles of Sears list. Tell you essentially, it's an instruction manual for using it. All right, so I've talked about Sears and where it came from and a little bit about how it works. So now I'd like to talk to you about how to suggest improvements to Sears. Again, you know, the title of this is changing, um, 
you know, making Sears better is the, is the power of, it, of that is in your hands. And this really is true. Um, so one way to suggest improvements is emailing Greyhouse. That's again, the publisher. So there's an email address um, on the website of Sears uh, to contact the editor. And the salespeople at Greyhouse, uh, they compile the comments and share them with the editor uh, when the editor is uh, being paid. <laughs> uh, which for now, that editor, there's no one there. Um, but I just signed a new contract to provide some updates to Sears this summer. So this summer, I'll be the temporary editor again. Um, I'll see any emails and I'll be excited to add any terms or make revisions that people suggest. So if you email uh, this list or this, this email address, um, I'll see it this time around, um, or maybe the next editor will see it the next time around. Uh, but I wanna actually suggest instead of each of you individually emailing uh, this email to, with your suggestions, I wanna suggest a slightly different approach for you. So I'm going to take a slight detour and talk a bit about Canada. So in 1978, some school librarians in, in Canada published the Sears list of subject headings, Canadian Companion. And you can see that on the screen. It was 50 pages long and it was meant to be a supplement to the standard Sears list with Canadian specific terms and historical periods. So the, the example that I really love to point out here uh, in the standard Sears list, the established term for ice hockey is ice hockey. Uh, in the Canadian companion, they've changed that to just hockey uh, because hockey is such a big deal there. Uh, they've also added terms um, in this uh, Canadian companion like Arctic sovereignty and bush pilots. So terms that are very specific uh, to the Canadian context. And they also added the ability to specify locations uh, with their provinces, like for example, adding the term Vancouver parentheses BC for British Columbia. Um, so again, this capacity to use um, uh, Sears in a very, uh, with the supplement in a very Canadian oriented way. So there were actually six editions of the Canadian Companion published. Um, the, the 21st edition of Sears, the main list of Sears, uh, published in 2014, actually incorporated all of those terms from that sixth edition into the main list. So now there's no longer a separate Canadian Companion. Those Canadian specific terms are incorporated into the same version, this, incorporated into the standard list. So, one way that South African librarians could consider approaching this work is by forming a working group to decide which headings would be most helpful for using in South African libraries. So think about this. If you could, let's just say, add, say, 200 headings to Sears that would reflect South African history and cultures, what would you want to add? So what if you brainstorm that list as a group? That might be in a more effective way to make additions to Sears that reflect the unique aspects of South African history and cultures. You could take the approach of the Canadian Companion and publish this supplementary list separately, or you could work with me or whoever the next Sears editor is and add those uh, to the standard Sears list so that it would be, um, you know, these terminologies that make more sense in a South African context will be a part of the main list. So I know that might sound a lot like a lot of work. Um, I'm just putting that idea out there in case you think it's worth considering. So I could sit here and tell you that I can add more South African topic in Sears, but I'm just an American. I don't know your history and cultures nearly as well as you do. So if you were interested in doing a project like this, I'd be happy to help every step of the way. Uh, so of course, you know, just adding South African terms to a system that has this um, very American bias doesn't make that system unbiased, right? So we know that. So I want to be clear that if you were to add, you know, do this work to add South African terms, that's not a solution that fixes all of the problems with Sears. 
a big part of my thoughts about critical cataloging in general is that library workers outside of the US shouldn't need to rely on these US biased systems at all. Uh, honestly, if you can create a, a, a working group that agrees on 200 new headings, I would say that you could do better than relying on Sears or even LCSH. You can create your own vocabulary. You can create multiple vocabularies. You could create vocabularies that reflect the language uh, and worldviews of the people who use your libraries. But I know that probably sounds like a, a very big task and maybe an unreasonable thing for me to ask of you. So maybe instead, let's start small. Let's start this work together. Let's start by making small improvements to these systems for your patrons. I would be delighted to work with any of you to make things a little bit better tomorrow than they were yesterday. And good, okay, so that's the end of my presentation. I'm a little bit short today, but I want to make sure that we had plenty of time for questions. Um, and I don't wanna to get too caught up in the details, which I'm very tended, to, I, I have a tendency to want to talk about the details way too much because I'm a cataloger. <laughs> um, I really hope that you'll have questions for me today. Um, please get in touch with me and let's plan uh, to do something awesome. So here's my email address, violetfox at gmail.com. And if you're on Twitter, uh, the Twitter is dying all the time. Uh, but if you're on Twitter, I'm at Violet B. Fox there. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Violet, for an informative presentation. We really do appreciate your time. I will then hand over to Ingrid, who will be conducting a Q&A. Ingrid. Thanks, Marcia. Yeah, thank you very much, Violet. That was very interesting. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's your opportunity to ask questions. And as Violet said, she's awaiting your eager your questions eagerly. The floor is open for any questions. You can put them in the chat or raise your hand. Now's your chance. And I have questions for you, um, you know, questions about what sort of, um, what sort of, um, you know, problems do you have with using Sears in general? Is the cost of Sears a big in issue for you? Are you able to subscribe to the web version of Sears or are you relying on an older uh, book? Oh yes, and I would love to know which libraries in South Africa are still are using Sears, yeah, and and which are using uh, Library of Congress subject headings, and which are using something different. Is anyone using something totally different? The majority of our um, academic libraries use uh, LCSH, um, but uh, so I think it is more the public libraries that are using Sears. But I think there are public libraries also that are also using LCSH. Um, yes, maybe someone would like to inform us and tell us which which system you are working on. Everyone is quiet. I know it's everyone is quiet. Um, I also, you know, I. Um, I do a lot of work also around uh, the Library of Congress subject headings and, you know, asking to change, um, um, making proposals to change those, um, those headings as well. So a lot of the same uh, principles are in play there. Um, there's been a lot of changes happening within the Library of Congress subject headings recently. Uh, in the last year and a half, there's been a lot of um, changes at the Library of Congress where they have hired more people um, and they have um, worked on creating more connections with the people who are proposing changes um, through something called the funnel system, which are funnels are small uh, informal groups of uh, catalogers who get together to propose changes and additions uh, to the Library of Congress subject headings. So um, not to get too far into the Library of Congress uh, details there, but there's a lot of the same principles in play here. 
this idea of trying to make the, the work more transparent and trying to get more people involved in this work. So it's really easy to kind of sit back and say, you know, oh, this system kind of sucks or this system, um, you know, is very biased. And like we can spend a lot of time critiquing these systems, right? We know that they're very American centric. We know that they're very Western centric. We know uh, that they have a lot of, um, you know, hierarchical issues, which make them um, very um, oriented towards uh, the, the majority view, right? Um, and especially Christianity is very, uh, in, you know, um, highly um, represented as opposed to other languages or other religions, which get uh, much less uh, detail. So we can sit back and kind of critique these works, but in the last year and a half, there's been a lot of changes um, in both Sears, uh, you know, in, in LCSH, and I, uh, you know, and Sears about thinking about how people can get involved in this work, uh, because uh, just kind of sitting back and critiquing it is not actually going to change anything. It, you know, it's, I think it's really valuable to crit criticize these systems. Um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't criticize them, you should, uh, but then we need to take that extra step to get involved to say, um, you know, if I don't like the way that it's working now, how should it work? Uh, mm -hmm. What, you know, what should be, what should be changed? So, you know, those sort of things, um, there's been a lot of change in, at LC recently. Um, and like I said, there's, this is a, a great time to do some of that work within Sears as well. Okay. Yeah, I just see there's, uh, there's a comment here from uh, Susan Patterson that the small and the corporate special libraries make use of their own subject headings, but uh, they use the same principles as LCSH. Um, well, that's great. So, Su Susan, I wonder if you have shared that, um, you know, you've, you've created your own subject headings, and I wonder if that's available online for other people to, you know, use or um, to adapt as a, you know, um, for their own purposes. I think part of the reason why uh, LCSH and, and Sears are, are so widely used is because they're easy to see, they're easy to share. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think we should all, you know, like put the work that we're out, that we create out there on the online uh, so that people can get inspired by it and do something similar on their own. Um, I can just add that uh, we specialize in cement and concrete, so they are specialized terms um our catalog is available online uh it doesn't have a really good structure in terms of cross references and things like that it's just a list but it is of interest if you are in the engineering field absolutely uh, yeah and i again i think that we we kind of sometimes downplay what we've created at our own institutions like oh it's not you know it's it's just kind of a simple structure or it's only interesting to these very specific group of people um, but you never know if you put something online if somebody out there is looking for that exact thing <laughs> and then that they that means that they don't have to do this work themselves they can build on what you've you've done um, and make it just a little bit better so i'm a big fan of you know doing this work in a very public way, again, this mm -hmm. idea of transparency um, and sharing our work. We're we're an information profession. We we are sharing a profession, um, and we should, you know, I think as as uh, metadata people, uh, work to do do the sharing a little bit better uh, than we have done in the past by kind of keeping things internal. Yes, indeed, and we actually also make use of the American Concrete Institute's list of, of subjects that they have, so um, their list is also available free of charge. You can download it or just access it on their website, so there, there is some kind of standardization. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know how much like localization you might need, maybe not very much in that in er that area. Maybe the American um, standards are, are relatively sufficient, uh, but you can imagine that it's not that's not the case in a general vocabulary, you know, like Sears or LCSH. So, um, yeah, I think the more, inf you know, information sharing that we can do, the better. Yes, Thanks so much for sharing information about yours. 
Yes, I can think of several South African terms that could be included in the South African list. I don't know how relevant it would be for international use, but something like Biltong, which is the South African version of what you would regard as beef jerky. Um, <laughs> yes. It's different, apparently, from beef jerky oh. because of the spices and things that are used. Um, we use the term fur trackers, which would be equivalent to the pioneers of the United States. But for us, using pioneers, South Africa, which would be the, the LCSH form, is it just doesn't make sense to us because fur trackers is, is, is the term we know here in South Africa. I don't know what the other people on the in the Zoom meeting, think about that. Yeah, I would love to hear. And you're right, there's a lot of terms like that where what's in the American version just isn't going to make sense uh, for your for your local users, right? Um, so that's where I think, um, you know, that's where I think if you if you wanted to do some of this work, you know, this idea of um, you know, adding adding some of these these terms to make make it more uh, you know uh, user friendly for South African patrons. I think that makes sense. There's a lot of American specific terms in Sears. There's a lot of Canadian specific terms in Sears. Why not South Africa? Why not lots of different places? Um, so I would really encourage folks to think about how um, just adding a few terms. Even if you don't do a big project, like I'm saying, um, you know, I think it could make a, a really big difference. So there's a, a question from uh, Polisi. She's asking um, what if you can uh, elaborate on the critical cataloging librarian and what does a critical cataloger do? What does it That's take to be a critical cataloger? That's a great question. Thank you, Melissi. Um, so I would say. Um, so being a critical cataloging librarian, so there's no, <laughs> there's no uh, position that's called a critical cataloger, there's no um, certificate or anything that you have to get. Um, it's really just an attitude, it's a perspective about our work in libraries. It's thinking about the way that we do things, especially in cataloging and metadata, um, and with a critical perspective. It's saying, how have we done things in the past? Um, that have um, not always been good, right? Some of the things that we've done in the past, um, we've made a lot of assumptions about who our users are. Um, we've kind of oriented our systems towards a very narrow idea, especially, and I'm gonna say in the US, um, you know, especially a, a very white and Christian um, and, uh, you know, heterosexual, like, a, a, uh, idea of who our patrons are and what sort of resources they're going to be looking for. So a critical cataloger asks questions about these things and says, why are they like this? And kind of understands um, that libraries are not always a force for good. I know that's really hard for some people to kind of think about because we are told all the time that libraries are heroes and that librarians, uh, you know, are always doing these good things. But if we just focus on the good things, we aren't able to critically look at ourselves and our practices and say, how can we make things better? How can be, we be anti-racist? How can we uh, work towards justice for people in the world through our work in libraries? So a critical cataloger looks at the things, the structures uh, that we have in place around cataloging and says, these are a product of their time and they reinforce some ideas about the world that we don't want to, to reinforce in the future. We want to have uh, structures that are much more appropriate for non-white users for for our for uh, for people for ethnic minorities and cultures and for uh, for black people uh, for people who are coming from different continents um, we just want to make sure um, that we are thinking about 
all of these things as we are doing cataloging. So it's very um, intimidating, right? We can, you know, we can just do the work that we have every day um, and we can get lost in the idea of, um, you know, just making sure that we get the work done. Uh, but a critical cataloger will take some steps back and say, look, um, you know, we can do things better than this in the future. Um, now that might mean um, changes at, the, at your local library, like it might mean uh, going back and making sure that um, things have been described respectfully and appropriately in your catalog. Uh, it might mean doing things on a national level, like getting involved in IGBIS or, and, uh, you know, saying, how can we improve uh, the way that we do subject headings in um, or classification here in South Africa? Or it can get in, be involved in an international level and say, how can we change the Library of Congress subject headings? How can we propose new setting, subject headings? Or we could, how can we in, get involved in changing the Sears list of subject headings? How can we add new things uh, to, the, to the main list to give uh, more flexibility to uh, local users? So those are the things that a critical, cataloging, uh, critical cataloger thinks about and does in their work. Um, it really is, again, just an attitude towards this work and not necessarily something that um, you are, uh, you know, there's not a job out there where you, uh, now you're a critical cataloger. It's just taking the work that you do every day and thinking about how it reinforces structures uh, that we don't necessarily want to reinforce and how you can make things better in that day-to-day -day work. <laughs> That's a long answer. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's just a comment there from uh, Louise with regards to, to the, the previous discussion we were busy with, um, that uh, perhaps CS should be localized per nation instead of centralized to the US or Canada. So, um, yeah, yeah. So I, I think most countries would have their own uh, local terminology and so on, and, and that what one uses a, a basic set of, of subject headings and then uh, localize for, for your local uh, environment. Right. So um, I would say that's a, that's a great point. And so what does it mean, you know, th this idea of critical cataloging, what does it mean that all of these standards are coming out of the U.S.? It means that these structures are very U.S. centric um, mm. and, and it has these, um, you know, ideas about how the world works based on our little brains here in, in the US, you know, right? <laughs> um, and we can't get outside of that. And so it takes you, you know, like people from outside of the US to point out all the places where uh, there's a there's, there's this bias that you can see, right? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I have, I, I wonder, you know, I, I think that that idea of the um, Canadian companion, I think that's actually a really good idea, you know, and, and, yes. like, and like Lewis said, you know, like, uh, this idea that um, maybe each country should have its own uh, localized version and maybe we should all use sort of a, a, um, a stripped down version, a, a sort of uh, basic version, which is the uncontroversial terms, which there's no such thing. Um, but, you know, maybe we could all use some kind of a standardized thing and then have, uh, you know, the U.S., folks use a US companion and the Canadian folks use a, a Canadian companion, companion um, that sort of thing. So that's an idea, but we can also, um, you know, I, I don't know if it makes more sense to add South African terms to this, um, you know, to the main list, or if it makes more sense for people at, you know, in South Africa to control their own headings, that might make more sense to you. Mm. So I would really encourage you to think big think big you know think that think about this what do you want to get out of this how do you want to control um the terminology that you are using in your libraries i would encourage you actually not to give it to sears <laughs> like don't <laughs> give it to me i don't know what i'm talking about like you know you're the experts in this um so i would really encourage you to use that power that you have tell your own stories right um i i, I would really encourage you to think um this big picture of what you want to, um, how you want to achieve your goals of making um, work more 
um, you know, making uh, your patrons better able to use their own local libraries. Yes. Uh, I see Susan has said there that uh, should, should ICBIS be creating our, what we call Ubuntu list of uh, CS list headings, <laughs> throwing the, call, the ball straight back into our court. <laughs> That would be amazing if if that's what if that's the work that comes out of this presentation. I would be so excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, I I think it can feel very intimidating, like this idea of creating your own structure. And it's it's a lot easier. I know I know how hard resources. Um, I know how difficult it is to to find the time and energy to do this work when you are just trying to do your day to day job and do it well. Um, but I honestly, I, I, I can't, if you think that words are important, you think that words are powerful and tell these stories, then I think it's worth controlling these words, you know, and having your own sense of what's important and what, what are my users looking for and not having um, these US structures, you know, like being a filter between the user and the books that they're, they're, they're trying to find. Um, I think it's worth considering. And I and I hope that you seriously will consider um, at least, you know, like at least get the ball rolling about thinking about what, what you might like to change. Yeah. <laughs> Colleagues, are there any more questions or, or uh, uh, comments that you'd like to make? You're most welcome, please. The floor is open. <laughs> a team must say that Susan was head up the task team to create this list. <laughs> it's it's very and again you know it it seems like a, a, a an impossible task, but honestly, so uh, when I first started editing Dewey, it seems like Dewey is huge. There's a huge number of of classification numbers, right? And even Sears, even Sears, which is just one volume is very intimidating mm -hmm. to try to, how do you edit that? Like, how do you add, how do you even start? And you, you know what you start, you start with the letter A and you just keep going down the list and you say, this term looks good. This term looks good. This term needs to change. Um, or we need to add this term. You do that, you do some brainstorming, you do some research. Um, all of it is actually really possible. <laughs> you just have to kind of um, want to decide, like decide that this is important to you. Um, I think words are really important. I think uh, the vocabulary that we use in our libraries are really important. Um, and so I'm willing to put in the, um, this work. Uh, and I wonder, you know, if people also uh, think that this work is important uh, to provide, again, that South African context. And I, I kind mm -hmm. of hope people think that's worthwhile. So uh, we, we have a saying here, I think it is South African, I'm not sure you might know or have heard of it. And it goes, how do you eat an elephant? You eat the elephant bite by bite. Right. So that's <laughs> that's, how that's you what, yes, I've, I've heard that and that's wonderful. And it really does get right at the heart of it, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, there don't seem to be any more questions. Colleagues, any comments? Okay, then um, I'm going to hand over to, um, is it Sarah that are you, Sarah, are you doing the things? Yes, that is me. Hello. Okay. <laughs> My camera on for a little bit to say hello to everyone. Um, and just to say thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Violet, thank you so much for, for coming in and speaking freely about these topics. And I think, you know, coming from the perspective of working with cataloging and metadata, you personally, at least, you sometimes have the sense of dissonance when, you know, going to school and you're learning about the systems and the standards that, that you need to use and, and the principle of, of universal access, which is obviously very important, but sometimes you start feeling that maybe 
there's a cost to, to local nuance and identity with that approach to, to cataloging and metadata work. Um, so I think, you know, challenging ourselves a little bit, thinking, well, what if we tried something a bit differently? Uh, I think it's it's really invaluable, and I, I hope that um, our uh, our members can feel like they can approach IGBIS. If anyone has any innovative ideas, <laughs> uh, would like to start a task team, <laughs> um, you can definitely reach out to us. And um, we have been working with a cataloging ethics task team at the moment too to look at the internationally developed cataloging code of ethics that came out in 2021 mm -hmm. and we're looking at adapting that for a South African context so um, exploring to to bring that local context I think it's it's really important so thank it's you wonderful. thank you for it's wonderful <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that you're working on that that um, that's you know I'm so it's it's just a matter of uh, skill building and like this idea of you know uh, taking on these these projects um, and they seem, again, they seem really scary at first, but um, the more you do that, the, the easier they become. So I can't, I can't wait to see what you all do uh, in the future here. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, I must also, of course, say, um, let's see, my list of... <laughs> Um, I would like to say thank you very much to the IGBIS committee and, of course, the LIASA National Office for putting all of this together today. Uh, it wouldn't have been possible without them. Um, and more so, of course, for, for everyone attending this afternoon. Uh, it was really great to share this time and uh, I hope everyone found something of value, uh, a little bit of food for thought. Um, not quite an elephant, maybe, at this stage, but... Um, as is tradition with our IGBIS events, we do like to take a group photo for anyone who is brave enough to put their camera on. Um, if you would like to do so now, we're going to take a quick snap. Uh, Apelile, do you know how to do the photo? Or shall I? Um, yes, I all around. <laughs> Oh, it's so lovely to see faces. Hello, everyone. We have some more cameras coming on. <laughs> Look at all those beautiful people. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> Smile, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for joining in on that. Um, we like to, to keep it as a sort of a record. <laughs> um.